disaster was quickly considered an opportunity. Union Station didn't escape that plague of all electricity. And in 1894, a chandelier in the women's waiting room caused a fire that burned the entire center portion of the depot. Despite the loss, railroad companies were open for business the very next day, and they soon took advantage of the destruction to update and expand the station. Waiting and baggage rooms again increased in size, and a stone clock tower replaced the original decorative tower made of wood. By centuries end, Americans viewed the transcontinental railroad journey not as the perilous adventure of a lifetime, but as a trip that might easily be undertaken by anyone who could afford the ticket. By 1900, it was clear that Union Station was handling more traffic than the existing building could bear. So plans began in the first decade of the 20th century to actually expand Union Station into a larger facility to accommodate this increased traffic. And in fact, it's good they did that expansion when they did because by 1920 and up to about 1950, Union Station received more trains than it ever had in its history. The 1914 expansion of Union Station to its current configuration replaced the entire center section with a Beaux-Arts style addition featuring a huge central waiting room with ornate wall sconces and chandeliers. The plaster arches around the ceiling were decorated with 2300 columbine flowers festooned high above rows of huge wooden benches that beckoned travelers laden with luggage to sit or even recline. Access to trains was greatly improved by subway tunnels running under the tracks that linked the train platforms with stairways. The American Railroad Network of Track peaked in 1916 at 254,000 miles. By the 1920s, it was estimated that 4 million people passed through Denver's Union Station every year. minimized wind resistance, 
and the perfection of the diesel burning internal combustion engine, an engine whose efficiency and ease of maintenance left the steam engine in its dust. On May 26, 1934, the streamlined Burlington Zephyr set a world record by running non-stop from Denver to Chicago, a distance of 1,015 miles in just 13 hours and 5 minutes. The train reached a mind-blowing speed of 112.5 miles per hour. But that wasn't the only source of its appeal. Renamed the Denver Zephyr a few years later, it was one of the first passenger trains to feature viewing domes on nearly every car. Gasoline rationing and troop movements in the early years of World War II dramatically increased the demand for rail travel, and the railroad lines competed for this business by offering a more and more luxurious travel experience. And back in those years, when you went on a train ride, you didn't wear your Levi's t-shirt. You put on your three-piece suit, wore your hat, the ladies were dressed in dresses and they wore their hats and gloves. When you went into the station, there was a red cap around there to meet you, to take your luggage. It was on the train when you got there. He took care of you. And the dining cars, the same way, linens and silver, and it was true silver. Railroads christened their passenger lines with names meant to capture all the adventure and romance of travel. And then there was the train that needed no poetry to sell its tickets, the ski train. Put into service in 1940, Denver's ski train was soon famous the world over for its spectacular 56-mile ascent to the Winter Park Ski Resort. Adding to the train's mystique was the fact that it passed through no fewer than 29 tunnels along the way, ending with the 6.1-mile Moffat Tunnel crossing the Continental Divide. Even more than the romance of travel, the electric atmosphere of Union Station during the World War II era derived from the troops themselves, thousands of small-town boys and men embarking on a journey to the other end of the world, uncertain whether they would ever return. Union Station's huge waiting rooms had long been a place where important family reunions and farewells took place. Added to the list now, were solemn vows exchanged between a soldier and his lover left behind. The tearful prayers of a mother, the brave but trembling handshake of a father, each bidding farewell to the loved one they might never see again. The end of these farewells always came about in the same way, with a voice echoing through the great hall announcing the departure of another train. Because of the war, America's railroads were in a rare position of financial strength. They moved quickly to adopt diesel engines throughout their fleets, greatly increasing their profit margins on the freight side. But despite the success of the marquee trains, the number of passenger trains in America was dropping precipitously. From more than 20,000 trains in 1920 to less than half that number by 1950. The decade of the 50s would see two developments with major implications for the long-range viability of passenger trains. The decision to begin construction of an interstate highway system and the introduction of passenger jet airplanes whose tickets were competitively priced with those of the railroads. When in fact the railroads were being asked to provide a service to compete with one that was faster in the case of the airplane more convenient in the case of the automobile, and in both cases subsidized by massive government expenditures. By the 1950s, airline transportation was overtaking the railroad line, and I think one of the key turning points when we begin to see the decline of Union Station is when they actually put up a neon sign that says travel by train. Uh, they're having to exhort passengers to come to Union Station by the 1950s, and certainly by the 1960s, train transportation is all but done. In 1958, for the first time on record, Denver Stapleton International Airport surpassed Union Station in the number of passengers served. On July 18, 2009, passengers boarded the 1950s era cars of the Denver Post Cheyenne Frontier Days train, powered by legendary Union Pacific Steam Engine number 844. The train made its inaugural run from Denver up to Cheyenne back in 1908, 
Today it still travels along the historic.